Now, a huge number of companies in the UK have tapped equity markets to shore up their finances in the midst of the coronavirus crisis. A new share sale is instead aimed at bolstering a stream of pop hits. Hypnosis Songs Fund owns the rights to thousands of pop songs, including four of Billboard's top five songs of the decade. It's looking to raise more, as much as 200 million pounds, by selling stock to fund growth. And joining us now is the CEO of Hypnosis Songs Fund, Merck Mercuriatus. Before founding the fund, he managed recording artists, including Elton John, GNR, Beyonce. Um, so it's great to have you on the program. Merck, thanks so much for joining us. What, first of all, what kind of reception have you gotten in terms of this share sale, and what do you plan on doing with the proceeds? Well, the, the share sale closes today, so I can't say the, the sort of reception other than that we've had extremely positive uh, discussions with our shareholders. You know, we, we, we came to market uh, exactly two years ago, started with 200 million pounds at that time, backed by some of the greatest institutional investors in the UK, invested it in great songs very quickly, managed those great songs to even greater levels of success, and then did it all over again with another 141 million pounds, with another 60 million pounds, with another 225 million pounds, and now at a catalog that has 13,000 songs in it, of which 2,000 of them almost are number ones and almost 8,000 are top tens, uh, we're about to, you know, hopefully hit our target of 200 million pounds and uh, put that into uh, additional songs. And we've got a, a pipeline of over a mm. billion pounds lined up of some of the greatest artists and songwriters and producers of all time. So it's quite an exciting time for us. Yeah, Merck, it does sound exciting. What is it that investors are looking for, for from, from an investment in hypnosis? Is this about the value of the songs that you own increasing over time, or is there an income stream they're looking for? Well, it's, it's really both. You know, we, what we demonstrated to the community when we first brought songs as an asset class, the idea of songs as an asset class to the market, was that these great proven songs, uh, because we only buy proven songs, are very, very predictable and reliable in their income. And of course, those are the same traits and, and reasons why we invest in gold. But one of the really fantastic things about songs, it's a completely uncorrelated asset class, because if people are living their best lives, they're celebrating with music, or indeed if they're experiencing the sort of challenges that we've experienced over the last, you know, sort of 20 weeks or so, they're taking comfort and escaping with music. So music's always being consumed. And when you look at our, our you know, total NAV return of 17.7% from last March through the end of, of our, our year for, for uh, March 31, 2020, we've got a 17.7% total NAV return because not only do we have great revenues due to the growth of streaming, uh, there was a copyright board law that was passed last year that gives the songwriter a 44% greater share of the income incrementally between last year and the end of 2022. So a dollar's worth of income that we bought last year will be worth a dollar 44 by the time we get to the end of 2022. So all of these factors, including our active management of the songs, where we're taking them and putting them in movies, TV commercials, video games, putting them on playlists, having new artists interpolate them. So, for example, the new John Legend album, which is number one in America this week, has an interpolation of our Al Green song, Let's Stay Together, on it. <clears throat> all of these factors are, are, are driving the revenue because there's genuine systemic change in the way that people are consuming music through streaming. Yeah, that's a good point that I wanted to bring up, Merck. You know, when I was a kid, um, I used to work at Generation Records in uh, Greenwich Village. I spent pretty much all of my paycheck on records, um, either there or over at Second Coming or at Bleaker Bob's. So, you know, I was spending probably 500 to to $1,000 uh, a, a month on, on records. And now I spend, you know, ten ninety nine. Now, I don't know if that's because I'm older, but um, do you think that, 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 that that's the, the case for a lot of people these days? So, uh, first of all, Matt, I was a customer of all three of those shops. So you, you may have sold me a television single or something at, uh, at Generation Records. But no, you know, what, what, what's really happening is that enthusiasts such as yourself or myself 
are spending our 120 pounds a year or 110 20 dollars a year on on uh, streaming services, but more crucially, the what used to be the passive consumer that was happy to you know listen to music ostensibly for free on the radio uh, or see it for free on television, but that never ever put their hand in their pocket and pulled out a ten dollar or a ten pound bill to pay for it is now paying 120 pounds a year, 120 dollars a year for streaming services because of the access. And that uh, passive consumer, believe it or not, is 349 out of every 350 people. If we look at the former benchmark for extraordinary success in our business, which was the platinum record, that's a million copies in a country like the United States that has 350, 360 million people in it. Now those passive consumers mm. are buying streaming services and spending money for the first time ever on music. And it's actually gone, music has gone from being a discretionary or luxury purchase to being very much a utility purchase.